The Lisbon Club is very happy to have with us Simon Cooper following our Lisbon talk on uh, football in the global context. And um, Simon, as you all know, is the author of brilliant books. I have three. These are my, these are my books. So, uh, and somebody that we always like to uh, read when we are looking at the Financial Times. So, Simon, thank you very much for having the patience to be here with us today for this interview. And I would like to start with the. Um, do you think that Brexit as a process and a very complicated one will have an impact uh, economically, financially, popularity level in terms of the uh, Premier League? I think Brexit is going to damage the UK a lot, but the Premier League probably not. Okay. Because you will get a system whereby players have to request work visas and it will be very easy. Mm -hmm. So if an English club wants to buy a Portuguese player, um, the club will arrange the request of the work visa, it will go through in three days, and if he's anything like a decent player, which he will be if he's being recruited to the yes. Premier League, it will go through no problem. The Premier League has become economically reasonably important to Britain, and it supports quite a lot of jobs. So if you think of Arsenal, I think they employ nearly a thousand people who work in everything from marketing to security. And that, of course, is funded by CV money, people watching around the world. So we need to keep buying your good players. So I think um, <laughs> Brexit won't be allowed to stop that. Okay, so yes, I think that, uh, I mean, if, if the Premier League is affected by Brexit, then everything else is just uh, falling apart. Yeah, I mean, I think the government is weighing up now whether to damage the British car industry and the aerospace industry um, by distancing from Europe. I'm not sure whether they will dare mm -hmm. to do that in the end. But I think uh, with the Premier League, really, the issue is uh, labour, mm -hmm. the importing of, for each team, let's say 15 to 20 well-paid foreigners. And I think that supports so many British jobs, it will be quite easy just to keep doing that. Okay. Um, uh, this year we have the European Cup, which is, which is now having a very different format than the previous ones. Do you think this is an improvement or are you waiting to see if it actually goes well? I think it's an improvement and it starts really in Portugal in 2004 because Michel Platini, uh, who was then the UEFA president, he saw, as I saw, this tournament here where a small and relatively poor European country had built many stadiums, which it was obvious then would never be fully used mm -hmm. afterwards in cities like Braga, which do not have huge numbers of football supporters. And so Portugal wasted this money on three weeks of football. And I think Platini felt a certain amount of guilt and understood this is not how we want to have football tournaments. And so uh, that was when he decided, let's try a tournament where you spread it around Europe. And that became 2020. Mm -hmm. So you actually think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea from the point of view of not burdening one country with building stadiums that won't be used again, which so often happens with mm -hmm. sports events, the Olympics too, uh, the Athens yeah. Olympics with enormous waste of money. But I think it's also good for countries which have never hosted a big tournament, like Romania, like Hungary, like mm -hmm. Denmark. It's great that, like Ireland, it's great that these cities are now hosting European championship matches. Yes, and I think that also after the Russian World Cup, if you look at the distances, and then if you compare that to the, to the European continent, then it's not really that big of a deal. No, it's not that far, but also I think what I've understood more and more as a journalist is the first round is just really, it's most matches are just national affairs. So when Portugal plays Hungary in the first round of Euro 2016, it's very interesting to Portuguese people and to Hungarians it's not really interesting mm -hmm. to most other people. Okay. Uh, the European Championship has this rather boring structure now where you have 24 teams, but 16 reach the second round. So to watch all these games <laughs> is not very, uh, it doesn't really get people excited outside the countries involved. So I think it's fine to have it as a kind of national affair for the first round. Mm -hmm. Then when things get more interesting, it also happens to focus at Wembley in London, which by then will be outside the European Union. So uh, we have a European Championship which ends uh, in a place that has just distanced itself from Europe, sadly. No, it is. It, it, it is quite the irony. But, um, and um, at the same time, um, 
How do you see the, um, the, the developments in terms of the, there's a lot of been a lot of criticisms as to, um, for instance, the number of games, the intensity of the games. Uh, Jurgen Klopp and his Liverpool actually opted of uh, not playing the League Cup uh, game when they were uh, the, having the um, World Clubs. I think I always keep changing, World you know, Cup. Yeah, World so Club Cup. They keep changing the names, and um, and I think that that was for some, you know, a, a quite of an, an astonishing uh, thing because he he decided actually mm. to make a point. I mean, he put all his uh, younger players in the pitch. Uh, do you think that's a concern? Well, Liverpool had to do that because they, I think they were playing two games in different continents in, in 24 mm -hmm. hours, so he didn't really have a choice. Yep. Um, this has been an issue for at least 20 years, so it's not really new. And obviously it has damaging effects on the players. What I would say though is, I mean, people are always talking as if football is risking its future and if it does these things, it will sell its soul to money and become less popular. But in fact, football just gets more and more popular around the world. So I understand the point of view of the people who run the game who think it ain't broke. You know, mm -hmm. you still have people all over the world who will watch both those Liverpool games, the young players and then the World Club Cup. I so um, although money is infesting football and changing football, it has not made football any less popular. I mean, mm. to the contrary, I mean, the money also follows the interest. Okay. And um, in terms of the, um, the, I think I would say the, um, the English national, national team, um, do you think that uh, this can be the, uh, the European Cup in which uh, the English uh, will, uh, will come back? Well, I mean, predictions of English success <laughs> have a long history of disappointment. I know, I know. This is very thin yeah. ice. Could this be our year? Uh, we can win it. So I can see the tabloid headlines before every single tournament England have ever played. Uh, just factually, they have more talented players than mm. they've had for a long time. Yes. And the English academies have changed in the last 20 years to encourage smaller, skillful, talented players moving away from the physical game. So you have players like Raheem Sterling or Phil Foden coming through mm -hmm. who 25 years ago would have been kicked to pieces in English academies, would not yes. have emerged. So there is a lot of talent. And then there's the advantage of playing the semis and the final if England get there at home, which is a major advantage. I mean, people think, why did England win in 66 but never at any other point? Is it because English football National used to support. be great or yeah. it wasn't? it's become worse? No, it's because they were playing at home. So... Um, I, if I had to choose one tournament in the last, in the last 50 years, really, that England have a good chance at, it would be this one. Okay. Because you actually see the build up in terms of quality and in terms of, I think it's always very difficult when you have a lot of talented players like Belgium, for instance. The, the tricky thing is, is how you transform all that individual talent and make it a collective team, you know, tactically thinking about the game and improving. And I think that England did really well in the, in the, in the last World Cup. Yeah, I'm not sure England were better at that World Cup than they'd been at other World Cups. They were luckier. I mean, they had a lot of very easy matches. Mm -hmm. uh, Tunisia, Panama. So you beat Tunisia and Panama, you're already in the second round. You lose to Belgium reserves with England reserves. Then uh, they were lucky against Colombia. They won on penalties. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, a, it's like a coin toss. England were not better. You play Sweden, quite a mediocre team, and suddenly you're in the semis. <laughs> so, whereas if you compare to 2010, which English fans see as a disaster, well, they were knocked out by Germany. I mean, that's a very different kind of proposition. So yes. in these short tournaments, so much is about luck. And then True. we analyze the tournament as if the winner was the best team and the team that got not knocked out of the quarters yeah. was terrible and it's not necessarily like that. No, I would agree with you. It's actually sometimes even the other way around, but even so. Um, one of the, I think, I think your, more per, your most personal book that you wrote is definitely uh, Ajax, the Dutch, the war. 
and uh, Ajax, whom we all, I mean, a team that had its really big highlights in the 70s and 60s. And, and how do you look, I'm sure with enthusiasm, to this revival of, in a way, Dutch talent? Mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that's also reflected in the national team, which is, ha had a very low point. But also Ajax. I mean, last year I, I was rooting for them in that semi-final against Tottenham, and but of course it was a really tough match. But how do you see it? Do you think that um, uh, the legacy of Ajax, despite having lost the young for Barcelona, the league for Juventus, and so forth, do you see it um, having a lasting impact? I mean, something has changed, has been revived in Dutch football. Well, there's a couple of things. Firstly, it's partly luck that you have talent coming through again, you know, so De Ligt and De Jong and suddenly you feel differently about the country. Partly it is the Dutch tradition of intelligent football. So Ajax play a kind of updated version of the total football of mm -hmm. the 70s with extreme pressing, you know, which was always yeah. part of total football. And Liverpool does very well mm -hmm. with slightly better players, but Ajax are beautifully carried out. So uh, the way they tackle the opposition defenders, three men at a time, brilliant positioning, mm -hmm is just, I think, high intelligence football. So it's partly the Dutch tradition. And then partly it's also money, because Ajax had this stupid idea, um, which came partly from Kauf, that uh, you shouldn't buy players, that that, was, that wasn't what determined success. And so Ajax kept selling players, and they accumulated something like 100 million, 150 million euros in the bank. They didn't spend it. And then finally, because they were doing so badly in 2016, under pressure from fans, they, um, the the people who ran the club reluctantly decided to spend 11 million euros on Hakim Ziyech just because the club was in crisis. Mm -hmm. And they thought this is a crazy amount of money, it it's not worth it. And Ziyech is, is maybe the best player Ajax have had in 20 years. He's amazing to watch. Mm -hmm. And so spending 11 million on Ziyech and later buying Dusan Tadic and Daily mm -hmm. Blind, who all cost money, money helps you become a semi-finalist in the Champions League Absolutely. if you spend it well. So without that money, you would have had a team of talents like De Ligt and De Jong going out early. Okay. So it's the combination of talent plus football intelligence plus money. Okay. And f last question, I don't want to, uh, to burden you. It's, it's about um, Barcelona. I know that you are writing a book on, on, on the club. Uh, we, we are, I mean, you wrote actually uh, a piece in the, uh, in the Financial Times. Uh, about the model of Barcelona or the no model of Barcelona. And, um, and I think that, um, could you tell us a bit about that, uh, that book that you're writing and uh, your, uh, your first impressions of uh, this, your idea about uh, regarding Barcelona? Well, I began writing the book because the club were very generous in giving me access. The club mm -hmm. is not authorizing the book, so I can say what I like, but okay. they've been very helpful in opening doors. So I've interviewed already dozens of people who work at the club. So what I'm trying to do is is three legs of the book. One is Johan Cruyff, who's the father of not just of Barcelona, but of modern football. He reinvented mm -hmm. the way football is played. And I grew up in Holland in the Cruyff years. Uh, he was my hero. And he, I think, is the most interesting man in football mm -hmm. in, over the last 40 years. So I'm trying to describe this very mm -hmm. complex, difficult, sometimes impossible but, person. Yeah. For, but hugely creative person. And then there's Messi. How does Messi do what he does? So I don't want to look at the personality of Messi. I don't think that's very interesting. I want to look at the, his art. Just let's try and explain how you beat three players and put it in the top corner. Mm -hmm. So it's like you're writing a book about Picasso's paintings. How does he do what he does? Mm. And then the third bit is how does a modern club work? And Barcelona understand that nobody understands how football works. So it's not that <laughs> you can kind of through brilliant planning, create the perfect football club. They, they don't do that. They're trying mm. to understand themselves what, what football is. And so you can't uh, create a Messi or a Busquets, or you can't certainly tell them how to play football, but you can understand football a little bit better by watching what Messi and Busquets do. And so the club is very humble, I think, in mm -hmm. understanding that they don't know very much about what they're doing. Nobody does. But they need to understand it better because Messi has hidden if if you do things badly it doesn't matter so much because messi in the end he saves you he will yeah and he saves you for 15 years one day messi won't be there anymore 
and then you have to start thinking. And that, I think, is the moment that Barcelona is approaching. Yes, and I think that's uh, why your book is so timely, because we all feel the same. And I'm so glad that you mentioned Busquets, which is probably my favorite player. So, Well, Frankie de Jong is, of course, my favorite player. But, uh, <laughs> I, I can imagine, opinion. I can yeah. imagine. But Frankie has a lot of, let's hope so, very good years ahead of him. Busquets is, uh, is, is finishing in terms of, yeah, I mean, he's 32, 33. 32. So I think that uh, in that sense, he is, he is a bit like Messi. I think that Messi and uh, Busquets are the two final heirs of that model, no model, Barcelona mm -hmm. that was so successful. And I, I'll never forget that midfield ever. I mean, Busquets, Xavi and Iniesta, I mean, that mm -hmm. will be in my heart forever. So, um, but I do look uh, very much forward to reading your book. And uh, thank you so much for this very interesting conversation. And if you do have the time and the, in the enthusiasm regarding football, please take a look at our Lisbon talk and Simon Cooper's ideas on how, to, uh, on how football helps you understand the world and societies.